Okay. Now, uh, last, uh, I think it was uh, during the introductory lecture uh, to the head and neck uh, region, uh, we uh, defined the boundaries of the neck. Uh, if you remember this slide, uh, we said uh, uh, the inferiorly it is attached to the uh, superior border of the, uh, the manubrium, the suprasternal notch area, then the superior uh, uh, surface or the border of the clavicle up to the acromion. Then uh, from acromion, you draw an imaginary line to the uh, vertebra prominence, that is spinous process of C7. And uh, then you continue uh, all the way on the other side, the same lines. Uh, superiorly, you start with the external occipital protuberance, superior nuchal line uh, to the back of the ear, then along the back of the ear up to the mastoid process, then you jump from the mastoid process to the, the, the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible, then along the posterior border of the ramus of the mandible, inferior border of the mandible, um, all the way to the other side. Uh, so these are the boundaries of the neck. Uh, so uh, having that in mind, we will discuss uh, further about the, uh, the fascial arrangement and the compartments and the contents of the neck. Um, when it comes to contents and other details, when I uh, go through the slides, I will not uh, mention everything you know, that is there in the slide because uh, maybe you know, it's uh, too much if I try to mention everything, but I will highlight the main points uh, later, you know, you can look at the lecture and grab the uh, small points. Now, uh, like in any other place, in the neck also, when it comes to fascia, uh, there are two uh, types of fascia. You have the superficial fascia and deep fascia. And superficial fascia is the subcutaneous fat layer. Now, uh, uh, in, the, in the neck region, uh, like in any other place, you get the cutaneous nerves in the subcutaneous fat layer, then you have superficial veins, in this case, uh, the external jugular vein and its tributaries, uh, and you have what is called anterior jugular vein also there. And uh, then uh, you get the, um, no, it's mainly the external jugular vein, okay, anterior jugular is uh, deep actually. And then uh, you get the, uh, the superficial uh, lymph nodes, you can call them superficial cervical lymph nodes. Then uh, uh, the, the, the difference, uh, some of these things are there in other places also. You get lymph nodes, you get veins, cutaneous nerves. Uh, but uh, a special thing about the neck is that you get a muscle in the, uh, the superficial fascia or the subcutaneous tissue layer, which is called platysma muscle. Uh, now that muscle uh, belongs to a group of muscles called paniculus carnosus muscles. If you read the first uh, chapter last, you get this term, or you can search in the internet uh, what is meant by paniculus carnosus. So the, these these type of muscles are found uh, abundantly in animals. Uh, now, if you look at a cow, uh, it can move its skin by contracting muscles. Uh, we can't do it uh, often uh, unless it is the, the facial muscles uh, which are attached to the dermis of the skin. That's why we can make. Uh, uh, changes in the facial muscles, facial expression. So they are paniculus carnosus muscles. Platysma muscle also belongs to the same group. Uh, even though it's in the neck, uh, it is supplied by the facial nerve. Uh, it, is the, um, it is the nerve that supplies muscles of facial expression. So the same nerve, uh, the facial nerve has several branches. Uh, if you study it later, there are five main branches after it passes through the uh, parotid gland. Before that, it gives three, three branches. So altogether, there are eight branches given by the facial nerve. You don't have to buy heart this now. You will study it later when you do the cranial nerves. Uh, so the facial nerve has eight branches. When it, once it comes out uh, from the stylomastoid foramen, and uh, five of these branches are given in the parotid gland, and the fifth branch is the cervical branch. So that is the branch that supplies the uh, Platysma muscle here, so it belongs to the group of muscles which are called muscles of facial expression, um, even though it's in the neck. So since this muscle is attached to the skin, when the muscle contracts, skin can move. Actually, you can do that now. Uh, I don't know whether you can see it here. When I contract my muscles, the neck uh, skin moves. So you can uh, you can contract your muscle and see like that. Uh, so this muscle is attached to the inferior border of the mandible here. 
and it it uh, it is attached to some of the muscles uh, around the oral cavity, uh, obicularis uh, oris, then some other muscles around the oral cavity. There are other muscles called the depressa anguli oris and all that. Uh, so this is attached to these muscles as well as the inferior border of the mandible there. And here, uh, of course, it is attached to the skin in most of these places. And here it blends with uh, this fascia of the pec major and uh, deltoid muscles. So it's a, uh, it's a muscle like this attached to fascia there and the skin. So when you contract the muscle, these areas will move, uh, especially the skin will uh, move. So remember this uh, point about the fatisma muscle. So that is about the superficial uh, fascia. Uh, you can call it superficial cervical fascia. Then the other layer is, I don't know whether I have anything else related to. So, yeah. Uh, so, these are still the continuation of the patisma muscle, uh, the attachments and the innovation, all I mentioned um, about the patisma muscle. And coming back to the slide, uh, now, uh, so this can be called uh, superficial cervical fascia. Then the deep fascia can be called deep cervical fascia. So, that means deep fascia of the neck. Uh, so we will uh, then discuss about the deep uh, fascia of the neck or deep cervical fascia. Uh, now deep cervical fascia uh, has four parts to it. So there is one uh, part which is called investing layer. Then there is pre-tracheal fascial layer, pre-vertebral fascial layer and the carotid sheaths. So these are the four types of deep neck fascia or deep cervical fascia. So this investing layer, if you give the full name of investing layer uh, to include the deep fascia also in the same name, you can call it um, investing layer of deep cervical fascia. Okay, investing layer of deep cervical fascia, which encircles the neck, which encircles the neck and uh, superiorly and inferiorly, it is attached to the boundaries of the neck. Now we just mentioned the boundaries of the neck. Uh, upper and lower boundaries of the neck. This investing layer, when it encircles all the contents of the neck, superiorly and inferiorly, it's attached to the upper and lower boundaries of the neck. So it's completely encircles the neck. In certain places, it goes beyond the boundaries a little bit. Uh, we'll come back to it when we uh, completely do it. So then you get this pretracheal fascia, pretracheal fascia. Uh, so this this pretracheal fascia actually later, you know, you will see it can contributes to form the visceral compartment by uh, enclosing all the, uh, the, the visceral organs like uh, thyroid, the parathyroid, uh, trachea, esophagus, and pharynx. So that is pre-tracheal fascia. Pre-vertebral fascia is the other fascia which lies behind pre-tracheal fascia. Uh, and pre-vertebral fascia, the name suggests that it surrounds the um, vertebral column, cervical vertebral column. Uh, with the muscles surrounding the vertebral uh, column. Then the last one uh, is the carotid sheath, which, which actually uh, surrounds the vascular compartments, including the deep uh, veins and arteries and the vagus nerve. So we'll, we'll uh, take them you know, one by one. It's too much to do it uh, at once. Uh, now, investing layer of deep cervical fascia first. So this is this one. Uh, we'll take that one first. Now, I said that uh, it is attached to the uh, boundaries uh, of the, should I remove the video? Yeah, maybe, you know, maybe I should stop the video, you know, it disturbs. Let me stop the video. Okay, now, uh, investing layer of uh, deep cervical fascia, uh, it is attached to upper and lower boundaries of the neck, I said, so it's attached to the, uh, the manubrium, superior border of the manubrium here. Uh, sorry, superior border of the manubrium here, then the superior uh, surface or the border of the clavicle, then acromion here, then from there it jumps to the, uh, the, the vertebra prominence there, and then uh, it is uh, here in this case it's attached to the superior nuchal line here at the center, uh, then uh, it is at the upper border, it is attached to the external occipital protuberance and superior nuchal line. Uh, sorry, this is attached to ligamentum nuchae here, okay, over the spines of the vertebrae. Then the superior external occipital protuberance, superior nuchal lines, then uh, from the mastoid process to the, uh, the, the, the inferior 
border of the mandible here so there are slight differences okay then all the way along the inferior border of the mandible to the other side and here uh, between the the inferior border of the mandible and the mastoid it splits it splits here uh, and there's a superficial layer and a deep layer the two layers will surround the uh, the parotid gland so this uh, superficial layer actually forms parotid fascia so this superficial layer forms parotid fascia and it is attached to the zygomatic arch here okay um, then the deep layer goes deep to the parotid gland uh, and actually even though i don't draw it here uh, i removed that part from the slide it forms a ligament here it uh, forms a ligament deep which is called stylo mandibular ligament attached between the styloid process you know the styloid process is like this and the mandible here is like that so there's a ligament between the uh, styloid process and the mandible uh, so it forms the stylo mandibular ligament uh, which i didn't put it here it's too much maybe for you so then uh, other important thing is this splits this fascia uh, the investing layer of deep cervical fascia splits to enclose the sternocleidomastoid muscle here with its two heads and the trapezius muscle there okay so the two muscles uh, it, it closes the two muscles uh, splitting to enclose them then here again it splits uh, anteriorly in this area uh, and uh, so you know once it splits and gets attached to the superior border of the mandib uh, the, the manubrium uh, in the space created by the split uh, fascia you get the anterior jugular veins so they are not in the superficial fascia they are in the uh, deep fascia in that area uh, within the two layers of the investing layer of deep cervical uh, fascia uh, so this i mentioned the superficial layer which is this one uh, which forms the uh, superficial layer of the parotid fascia now if you take the parotid gland uh, you get the the any gland you know has its own capsule so parotid gland also has its own capsule then this fascia superficial layer uh, forms a rather false capsule fascial capsule over it uh, and then you know deep fascia also the, the, the deep layer also uh, passes deep to the uh, true capsule of the gland there and the other thing is the investing layer uh, is also attached to the hyoid bone here you get the hyoid bone here so in the midline anteriorly it is attached to the uh, hyoid bone uh, so that you know you get this you know nice uh, uh, appearance you get the the neck and the flow of the mouth like that uh, that appearance comes because of this uh, attachment and of course the attachment of muscles underneath to the hyoid bone here then uh, coming back to the compartments of the neck now we uh, we previously in the previous lecture we said there are uh, four compartments in the neck you get a, a visceral compartment two vascular compartments on either side and a, a vertebral compartment we said then now that we have done the deep fascia of the neck we know that these compartments are made by the arrangement of the deep fascia now the first one is the investing layer of deep cervical fascia that we just mentioned uh, which actually encloses sternocleidomastoid in front and the trapezius behind and uh, it forms uh, it, it uh, it's like a stocking it encircles the whole head uh, it's attached here to the superior uh, the, the ligamentum nuke uh, at the back and in front to the hyoid bone uh, at c3 level now uh, then you can see the other three layers of deep fascia now the first one we discussed already uh, you can see the uh, pretracheal fascia here forming the visceral compartment which includes trachea uh, the esophagus uh, thyroid gland parathyroid gland uh, and so on then uh, you get the vascular compartment here formed by carotid sheaths other type of deep cervical fascia so the vascular compartment will include the uh, the internal jugular vein uh, and the uh, the common carotid uh, over the internal carotid artery uh, the external carotid actually leaves the carotid sheath once it is given off we'll go back to the details of that later then inside the carotid sheaths you get uh, the important nerve the vagus nerve uh, also in the carotid sheaths uh, and the, the the fourth one now it's one first type of deep fascia second type of deep fascia 
and the third type of deep fascia carotid sheaths. Then the fourth one is the prevertebral fascia, this one, which encircles the vertebral uh, compartment. Uh, the, that is the, uh, the cervical vertebral column and the muscles surrounding the cervical vertebral column. Uh, so this is called prevertebral uh, fascia. Then we also discussed the, about the triangles of the neck uh, during the first introductory lecture. We said uh, the, the sternocleidomastoid attached between the mastoid process here uh, and the, uh, the, the manubrium and the, uh, the clavicle here. You have a, a clavicular head and a manubrial uh, or the sternal or manubrial head there. That's why you call it sternocleidomastoid muscle. Now, uh, having the sternocleidomastoid muscle there uh, and the trapezius at the back here will divide the neck into uh, two compartments, two neck, uh, two triangles uh, with the midline, of course, in the middle. It divides the neck into an anterior triangle and a posterior triangle. So we said that. Now the anterior triangle uh, has its base here, mandible, and the apex here. Uh, at the manubrium. Then the posterior triangle has the base here and the apex uh, high up at the occipital region. Then we said uh, these triangles are further divided into sub triangles. Now the posterior triangle sometimes it is not divided like that but if you want you can divide uh, by the presence of uh, this inferior belly of omohyoid muscle, inferior belly of omohyoid muscle divides the posterior triangle into an occipital triangle above and a subclavian triangle below. Subclavian vessels are related to this triangle. Then the anterior triangle is a bit complicated. Uh, the anterior triangle on each side is divided into uh, four sub triangles uh, having the anterior belly of digastric muscle and the posterior belly of digastric muscle. Uh, these two with the inferior border of the mandible will form what is called digastric triangle or you can call it submandibular triangle. Uh, so the contents we will learn later. So you have the hyoid bone here. Then uh, the posterior belly of digastric and the superior belly of omohyoid with the, uh, the sternocleidomastoid here will form the uh, form another sub triangle called carotid uh, triangle. Then uh, having the, um, uh, the midline here, having the midline here, with the hyoid bone in the middle, superior belly of omohyoid and the, the lower part of the sternocleidomastoid will form another triangle here, which is called the uh, muscular uh, triangle, because you get uh, muscles in that area. Then there's a very small, not very significant triangle, which is called submental triangle. So you get the midline here and the anterior belly of digastric, and you get the, uh, the hyoid bone here. Uh, so that means the uh, makes the submental triangle. So you have digastric or submandibular triangle, uh, the carotid triangle, muscular triangle, uh, and the submental uh, triangle as sub triangles of the anterior uh, triangle. Now, uh, if you look at the posterior triangle, uh, now now this is prevertebral fascia. Now we said that the uh, these muscles uh, muscles surrounding the um, I'll go back. Muscles surrounding the, uh, the, the cervical vertebral column is enclosed by prevertebral fascia. Now, if you look at the posterior triangle, now this is a trapezius muscle. I'll delete, you know, it's too much of writing there. Okay. Now, this is a sternocleidomastoid. This is trapezius. Now, this is the posterior triangle area. Now, if you look at this area from this angle, this is your eye. So then you see the roof of the posterior triangle. Uh, once you remove the skin, is formed by the uh, investing layer of deep cervical fascia roof. Then the flow is actually formed by the uh, prevertebral fascia here, covering these uh, scalene muscles and you know muscles above that, scalenus anterior medius and muscles above that, uh, the levator scapulae muscles. So we are referring to this area. So that's why I brought you back to that slide. So then if you go, go to that area, now you will understand, you see the prevertebral fascia here, prevertebral fascia covering the muscles, forming the flow of the uh, posterior triangle. 
So if you start from above here, you get the semispinalis capitis, very small area. You will not remember these names uh, until you see this specimen. You get the splenius capitis after that. Then the other muscles are a bit familiar to you. You get the levator scapulae here, then the scalenus uh, medius and scalenus anterior muscles in this area. Uh, so these muscles will form the flow covered anteriorly by the pre-vertebral fascia. Then, uh, then you get uh, the, the, the parts of the brachial, roots of the brachial plexus. Can you all hear? Hello? Sir, there were some disturbances in the previous uh, few slides, uh, descriptions of the few, the previous mm -hmm. few slides. slides. So, uh, where did you hear last? Where did you hear last? Which part did you hear last? Posterior triangle? You heard about the flow of the posterior triangle, muscles forming the flow? Yes? Did you hear the muscles forming the flow of the posterior triangle? This is the internet problem. So there are disturbances in the audio. Okay, we'll see. Yeah. yeah okay, so I'll get back to it anyway, but... Uh, okay. We have to share the screen again. Okay, now we were discussing about uh, okay, we were discussing about the muscles that form the flow of the posterior triangle. Uh, now, uh, posterior triangle, the flow is formed by the semispinalis capitis above, splenius capitis next. These muscles, you are not familiar with the names of these muscles. Then you get the familiar names. You get the levator scapulae, scalenus uh, medius, and scalenus anterior uh, muscles forming the flow covered in front by the pre trachea fascia pre vertebral fascia okay and the the nerves uh, the, the the brachial plexus roots of brachial plexus you know emerge between scalenus anterior and scalenus medius muscles so they actually uh, lie deep to the pre vertebral fascia now even though uh, the pre vertebral fascia forms the flow of the uh, the fourth uh, the, the, the posterior triangle um, these structures that lie behind uh, the prevertebral fascia, between the muscles and the prevertebral fascia, fascia, are still taken as contents of the, uh, the posterior uh, triangle. Uh, because the reason is the, it's clinically important to remember them. So you get, other than the brachial plexus uh, roots, you get the branches of the cervical plexus in that area. I'll show you the next slide. So you see the branches of the cervical plexus, cervical plexus is formed by uh, cervical anterior primary rami of cervical spinal nerves from C1 to C4. Then you get the brachial plexus from C5 to T1, you know that. So then uh, the, the branches of cervical plexus also lies behind the prevertebral uh, fascia here. So they are, some of their branches, they lie behind the prevertebral fascia and supply the muscles in that area. Then the cutaneous branches to supply the skin they will pierce the uh, prevertebral fascia uh, and the, uh, and they supply the, uh, the, the and they pierce the investing layer of deep cervical fascia also and they supply the skin now some of the important nerves are the supraclavicular nerves uh, and uh, then you get this uh, uh, great auricular nerve which is this one great auricular nerve which supplies the skin uh, over the masseter muscle in that area. So immediately the area in front of the, uh, the ear over the mandible, you get the masseter muscle here. So the skin over the masseter muscle is supplied by a great auricular nerve with C2 uh, spinal segment because uh, now uh, the face area, if you look at the face, this, these areas are all supplied by the uh, cranial nerves. Uh, the fifth cranial nerve has several divisions. So these divisions will supply the, uh, 
the rest of the skin of the face but the only exception is this area of the face over the masseter muscle is supplied by this great auricular nerve through c2 uh, dermatome uh, so that's an important point to remember uh, so then uh, this is a branch of the cervical plexus actually okay so which is a content of the posterior uh, triangle then you get uh, all these uh, vessels subclavian vessels then supra scapular uh, occipital transverse cervical all these you know these are some of these are branches of the subclavian uh, artery uh, subclavian vessels uh, and then they all lie in the uh, the root of the neck here in this area um, in the posterior triangle veins and arteries so external jugular vein uh, which is in the superficial fascia we said external jugular vein uh, uh, how it ends uh, is that uh, it enters the subclavian vein you get the subclavian vein like this uh, formed by the axillary vein at the outer border of the first rib you know that uh, and the, the subclavian uh, subclavian vein here and this uh, external jugular vein opens into the subclavian vein uh, so uh, the external jugular vein to, in order to open into the subclavian vein uh, this is the external jugular vein it has to pierce the roof of the posterior triangle uh, which is the, uh, the investing layer of deep cervical fascia so it pierces uh, the roof and then enters the uh, subclavian vein at the posterior triangle uh, so these are the things happening in the uh, posterior triangle then the other point uh, so this is the point that i mentioned before though the branches of cervical plexus trunks of brachial plexus and subclavian uh, vessels lie deep to prevertebral fascia they are considered as contents of the posterior triangle from a clinical point of view uh, because in, in, in surgery uh, uh, these structures in the posterior triangle are safe as long as uh, the prevertebral fascia is not disturbed by the surgeon okay so that's an important point so as as long as the prevertebral fascia is intact so you are you can be sure that you have not damaged the uh, the nerves and the main vessels there uh, so that's the point that you need to remember now this diagram actually uh, gives you uh, a picture of how the uh, the branches of the cervical uh, plexus are given off so this is this great uh, uh, great auricular um, nerve which supplies the skin over the masseter muscle in the face so this supplies the uh, the back of the head area uh, so then the the phrenic uh, you get the supraclavicular nerves it's not clear supraclavicular nerves supplying the skin over the tip of the shoulder tip of the shoulder then you get the phrenic nerve which is a very important nerve given by the cervical plexus phrenic nerve given from c3 c4 and c5 uh, which supplies the diaphragm uh, so you get this you know one theory behind the referred pain of diaphragm uh, referred diaphragmatic pain to the tip of the shoulder because these nerves supply the uh, the tip of the shoulder skin and this one supplies the uh, the diaphragm so pain arising from the diaphragm um, sometimes is felt as coming from the tip of the shoulder uh, so that is mainly because of the c4 uh, segment uh, because the supraclavicular nerves they uh, have c4 and c3 uh, dermatomes then uh, i i would like to draw your attention otherwise you will find it uh, very abrupt uh, when i mention it later you can see another uh, structure that is formed there uh, from the branches of the cervical plexus which is called ansa cervicalis if you read this name it's ansa cervicalis now this ansa cervicalis uh, is uh, again a very peculiar arrangement you can see it uh just you know take a look at the ansa cervical not that it is so important to know details about the ansa cervicalis but the important thing behind it is that this this ansa cervicalis is the one that supplies muscles lying behind the hyoid bone which are called infrahyoid muscles uh, which are related to the thyroid gland so a lot of thyroid surgeries are being done these days uh, and these muscles uh, you actually uh, deal with this inf infrahyoid muscles we'll discuss these muscles in a moment now these infrahyoid muscles are actually supplied by this ansa cervicalis so how ansa cervicalis is formed 
uh, is this it has a superior root and an inferior root so the inferior root i'll tell you first uh, are branches from the c1 and c3 uh, cervical spinal nerves so that is the inferior root of ansa cervicalis which is a loop which is loop around the external jugular vein um, then um, a loop around the internal jugular vein yeah so then uh, superior root is this one coming from c1 superior root it hitchhikes uh, hitchhike means it goes with uh, the hypoglossal nerve hypoglossal nerve is the 12th cranial nerve so this uh, first cervical nerve goes with the uh, the 12th cranial nerve for some distance and then comes down uh, to to form the ansa cervicalis joining its inferior root it forms a loop here so if you do uh, dissections of the neck uh, you can't find it in all the bodies because you destroy it it's so delicate uh, some uh, students uh, can find it uh, if you happen to dissect if you are lucky um then uh, okay so then you know uh, there's a branch going to oh my there's a different issue so remember this ansa cervicalis business okay then uh, uh, pre vertebral uh, fascia we, we are discussing about the pre vertebral fascia uh, so we have already said that it lies in front of pre vertebral muscles uh, and the other important point is it extends the pre vertebral fascia extends around the subclavian uh, vessels and brachial plexus uh, and form the axillary sheath now in your dissect dissected the axillary uh, region uh, during the upper limb dissection you must have seen this axillary sheath covering the uh, the, the the cords of the brachial plexus and uh, the axillary vessels now the axillary sheath is a continuation of the pre vertebral fascia okay axillary sheath is a continuation of the pre vertebral uh fascia so remember that point uh then uh the other point here is that uh the uh, the the, the prevertebral fascia is attached to the base of the skull attached to the base of the skull and uh, it ends at the lower border of t4 vertebral body getting attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament there so this is what it means now now this uh, this red line here that you can see here this red line is the attachment of the pharynx to the uh, the base of the skull rough it's a rough uh, drawing of the attachment of the pharynx to the base of the skull now behind this you get the now this is the uh, the pre uh, tracheal uh, pre vertebral fascial uh, layer attachment of the pre vertebral uh, fascia to the base of the skull and here this is the uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament so this is this one anterior longitudinal ligament uh, which is also attached to the base of the skull here uh, then uh, if you if you locate the carotid sheaths also here now we, we didn't discuss the carotid sheaths yet now you can if i go back you will see now this is jugular foramen if you have studied the base of the skull this is the jugular foramen uh, from where the internal jugular vein starts and this this these are the carotid canals uh, through which the internal carotid artery enters the uh, the, the cranial cavity now uh, you can see this circle this uh, green line encircles the the carotid um, canal and the uh, jugular foramen so this is actually the attachment of the carotid sheaths okay so this is uh, the, the pre vertebral fascia these are the carotid sheaths okay so this is pharynx area okay now in this diagram so this is pre vertebral fascia okay now i'm showing you different uh, pictures this pre vertebral fascia behind this you get the anterior longitudinal ligament and here you get the posterior longitudinal uh, ligament which stops at the axis level okay it doesn't doesn't go into the base of the skull so you can see in this diagram this is from last i think uh, you can see the pre vertebral fascia here uh, finishing uh, you know stopping at l4 uh, the uh, t4 vertebral level getting attached to the anterior longitudinal ligament there so this t4 uh, if you have done the thoracic uh, anatomy uh, the lower border of t4 uh, the, the plane 
the horizontal plane passing through the sternal angle here and the, the lower border of uh, T4 here uh, divides the, the mediastinum into superior mediastinum above and the inferior mediastinum below. Therefore, the, the pre-vertebral fascia does not continue into the inferior mediastinum. Remember that point. It stops exactly at this same plane that divides the mediastinum into superior and inferior mediastinum. So remember that point. Now in this, the same diagram I'll show you, even though I didn't discuss it yet, pretracheal fascia. Okay, pretracheal fascia which encircles the, the trachea and the esophagus here. Uh, you can see it blends with the arch of the aorta here. Okay, so it blends with the arch of the aorta and the pericardium. Okay, so this is pretracheal fascia, uh, pre-vertebral fascia. This is pretracheal fascia. Okay, uh, we'll get back to it again. Uh, then uh, the phrenic nerve, the, the important phrenic nerve, it lies behind prevertebral fascia because the cervical plexus lies behind it. Uh, so it runs all the way behind the prevertebral fascia to enter the thorax. So remember that point. And the sympathetic trunk lies in front of prevertebral fascia. Okay, sympathetic trunk lies in front, and the cutaneous branches, of course, has to pierce the uh, prevertebral fascia to. Uh, reach the skin, I told you before. Then, you know, this is a diagram to uh, explain the position of some of these nerves that I mentioned. Now, in this diagram, you can see this is the posterior side. Okay, this is the posterior side. Uh, and you can see the, uh, the scalenous anterior muscle in the neck. Uh, the phrenic nerve lies immediately in front of the scalenous uh, anterior muscle covered uh, in front by the prevertebral fascia covered in front by the prevertebral fascia so this is one of the muscles that form contribute to form the flow of the uh, posterior triangle we said that in a mom moment before then sympathetic chain is something like this so we i said it lies in front of prevertebral fascia okay sympathetic chain is something like this so it's in, in a position it's uh, in front of prevertebral fascia but medial to the phrenic nerve. Phrenic nerve is between the prevertebral fascia and the scalenous anterior muscle. Now, now, uh, now you don't have uh, the chance to dissect, uh, unfortunately. Now, your scalenous anterior muscle, if I draw it, it's like this, coming from the, the spine here uh, to the, uh, the, the first rib, scalenous tubercle of the first rib. Phrenic nerve passes over this muscle like this. Okay, this is a very typical appearance in uh, dissections. So it crosses the scalenous anterior muscle in front like this. It's a very slender nerve, uh, the phrenic nerve. Uh, so the, the, the bigger, the, the sympathetic chain lies, um, now this is uh, on the posterior side, but the sympathetic chain lies uh, in front of it. Okay. Okay, then uh, the rest of it, I'll take it back. Then, uh, then the carotid sheath, the other deep uh, facial layer, carotid sheath lies in front of the sympathetic chains like this. Okay, so this is pre-vertebral fascia, this carotid sheath. Now it encloses carotid sheath, the deep in the, the, the internal jugular vein, laterally and the uh, carotid vessels uh, medially. Then there's another nerve inside the carotid sheath, you get the vagus nerve. Inside the carotid sheath, you get the vagus nerve between the, the carotid uh, vessels and the internal jugular vein uh, in between, behind them. Okay. So actually in dissections, these two are not separated like this. Uh, they, they, uh, they are stuck together, you know, they are together. So you have to separate them out. You have to pull them uh, to the sides to see the vagus nerve uh, behind, in between them. Okay. So try to imagine, you know, what I am telling you here. Then uh, behind the carotid sheets only you get the sympathetic chains. So one can say that the sympathetic chain lies between the carotid sheath and the uh, prevertebral fascia, which is correct. True, if you say that. Okay. If someone says prevertebral fascia lies between sympathetic chain and phrenic nerve, again, that is, that is correct. It lies between the two uh, nerves. And the vagus nerve lies um, actually within the carotid sheath in front of the uh, sympathetic chains. Then the other type of deep uh, cervical fascia, 
pretracheal fascia uh, pretracheal fascia uh, pretracheal fascia uh, you can see attached above to the body of the hyoid bone here then it's attached to the, 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 the thyroid cartilages in front on either side of the midline then it attached to the oblique line on the thyroid uh, cartilages if you remember oblique lines then laterally it fuses with the, the carotid sheaths on either side it fuses with the, the two carotid sheaths we just mentioned about the carotid sheaths okay so these are the carotid sheaths so the pre uh, pretracheal fascia blends here with the carotid sheaths laterally that's what i mentioned okay uh, and lower down it, it uh, continues down into the mediastinum area and blends with the adventitia of the uh, the arch of the aorta in that area blends with the adventitia of the arch of the aorta you get the heart like this and you get the arch of the aorta pretracheal fascia comes and blends with the uh, the, the adventitia of the great vessels not only the arch of the aorta even other great vessels in that area uh, and it, it also bl uh, blends with the uh, fibrous pericardium covering the heart okay the adventitia of the great vessels and the fibrous pericardium so you can have a rough idea about the pretracheal fascia now now here in that area it encloses the uh, the thyroid glands with the parathyroids uh, and trachea and the esophagus lying behind the uh, trachea that is pretracheal fascia now the carotid sheaths uh, i mentioned about the carotid sheaths here if you get a cross section of the carotid sheath this is how you see the carotid sheath if you take a cross section if you take it uh, below the level of the, the the superior border of the thyroid cartilage then this is how you uh, get it you get the common carotid arteries okay if you take the section cross section above the superior border of the thyroid cartilage where the common carotid artery divides into its internal and external carotid arteries instead if you get a higher cross section you instead of common carotid you will get internal carotid here not external okay it's internal carotid instead of common carotid then you get the internal jugular vein lateral to the now this is uh, anterior posterior and this is lateral okay lateral side this is medial side uh, then uh, this is actually ansa cervicalis okay so this is uh, the ansa cervicalis forming a uh, loop you might see it you know cut in two places uh, then you get the vagus nerve as i said before uh, behind the artery and the vein uh, in between then you get uh, this is also important deep cervical some of the deep cervical lymph nodes now there are superficial cervical lymph nodes in the superficial fascia then there are deep cervical lymph nodes in deep layers so some of these deep cervical lymph nodes will be found inside the carotid sheaths um, so if somebody asks you to list the contents of the carotid sheaths you can easily uh, list these components you can include both common carotid and internal carotid because in two places uh, two vessels uh, can uh, be located now few uh, clinical points uh, one clinical point actually uh, now pre vertebral fascia as we said before is attached here to the uh, the anterior longitudinal ligament at the lower border of t4 then the pretracheal fascia, uh, which is this one, pretracheal fascia, I will not disturb the diagram. Okay, pretracheal fascia, as you can see here, blends with the adventitia of the aorta and the fibrous pericardium. Uh, now, uh, if there are infections behind the prevertebral fascia, infections behind the prevertebral fascia means in this area. If there are infections behind the prevertebral fascia because of its attachment, firm attachment to the anterior longitudinal ligament at the lower border of T4, infections will from the neck, infections can only spread behind the prevertebral fascia uh, to the superior mediastinum area because the superior mediastinum is above this plane. Uh, it will not spread into the inferior mediastinum. So that's one point you need to remember because of this attachment of the, uh, the prevertebral fascia to the um, T4. Uh, level anterior longitudinal ligament then neck infections in front of pretracheal fascia now that is in front of pretracheal fascia in this area neck infections will uh, now the first one 
spreads like this and stops here. Second one, infections in front of pretracheal fascia will actually go in front of the great vessels and the heart into the anterior mediastinum because you get the anterior mediastinum uh, in front of the, um, the, the, the heart and the pericardium there. Uh, so then remember that point, infections in front of pretracheal fascia will track down into the anterior mediastinum. Okay. Then the neck infections between the two fascial layers. So you get pretracheal fascia here, that is this one. Then you get the pre-vertebral fascia, so that is this one. So infections in this area, that is, you know, surrounding the carotid sheaths, uh, infections in that area will spread behind the pretracheal fascia and in front of the pre-vertebral fascia. Now they will go into the posterior mediastinum because because you get the this is how you divide the mediastinum you get the, the thorax like this you get the plane passing through the sternal angle here and the, uh, the t4 lower border above that you get the superior mediastinum below that you get the inferior mediastinum then because of the fibrous pericardium and the heart here uh, that part is called middle mediastinum then you get the anterior mediastinum in front of it and the posterior mediastinum behind it okay so infections between pretracheal and prevertebral fascia will pass into the posterior mediastinum. Okay, if it is allowed to spread. So remember this clinical point. So you, this can be asked, you know, explain the anatomical basis of infections uh, between the pretracheal and prevertebral fascia spreading into the posterior mediastinum. Okay, so you can then describe the attachment. You can mention the attachment of these two fascial layers uh, and that, you know, gap between these two can be connected into the posterior mediastinum. Uh, then the anterior triangles, uh, anterior triangles, uh, now if you take the anterior triangles and you get the uh, hyoid bone like this, in the anterior triangle, uh, now muscles above the hyoid bone, there are muscles going above the hyoid bone like this, there are muscles like this and these muscles are called suprahyoid muscles then the muscles behind now you get the thyroid cartilage like this uh, behind the hyoid bone now muscles below this level are called infrahyoid muscles so when it comes to the anterior triangles you get uh, in the anterior triangle you get muscles above the hyoid bone which are called suprahyoid muscles muscles below the hyoid bone, which are called infrahyoid muscles. Now the main suprahyoid muscles are these muscles, digastric, stylohyoid, mylohyoid, and geniohyoid muscles. Uh, now all these muscles are uh, attached to the hyoid uh, bone somehow. Uh, and, this, and these muscles, because of their location, uh, uh, they can actually elevate the hyoid bone with the larynx. And they can also depress the mandible. If the if the hyoid is fixed by infrahyoid muscles, then the mandible will depress because they are attached to the mandible on the other side. So you get the mandible like this uh, here. Uh, then uh, you get the hyoid bone here. Some of these muscles are attached to the mandible. So either this is elevated or this is depressed. This is depressed. So these are the some of the, these muscles. How you can see them. You get this uh, digastric muscle which has got an anterior belly and a posterior belly. Then you have this stylohyoid muscle, this one, attached between the styloid process and the uh, hyoid bone. Uh, then you have this mylohyoid muscle, which is like a sheet, like a sheet. It forms the flow of the mouth. Uh, mylohyoid muscle so you get another mylohyoid muscle other other side muscle uh, in that area so that muscle has been removed to show you a deep muscle which is the geniohyoid muscle which lies deep to the uh, mylohyoid muscle that's why you have to remove the mylohyoid muscle on this side to uh, show the geniohyoid muscle so that makes uh, four muscles digastric the, with the two bellies anterior and posterior belly uh, stylohyoid mylohyoid and geniohyoid muscles. Now, uh, now these muscles have different nerve supplies. 
I, I think you cannot remember the nerve supply of you know all muscles like that. You need to learn certain other things to remember it. Uh, now, roughly, it, it's like this. Now, the digastric muscle uh, developmentally, it has two developmental origins. Posterior belly uh, develops from the uh, from one area, uh, and anterior belly develops from another area. So, based on that development, the posterior belly is supplied by the facial nerve, and the anterior belly is supplied by the trigeminal nerve. Seventh nerve here, and the fifth cranial nerve. Then, mylohyoid is also supplied by the uh, by the uh, same, you know, fifth cranial nerve. Uh, branches of the fifth cranial nerve. Uh, then, um, geniohyoid uh, is actually uh, supplied by uh, these uh, cervical uh, branches. And stylohyoid is another important one. It is also like the posterior belly of digastric. It has same embryological origin. Stylohyoid is also supplied by the facial nerve. Okay, so two supplied by the facial nerve. Uh, then. Um, Two in the sense, you know, one and a half posterior belly of digastric and stylohyoid. Then another one and a half supplied by the uh, trigeminal nerve. There is mylohyoid and uh, the, the anterior belly of digastric. Then one supplied by the uh, cervical nerves. So these are all suprahyoid muscles because the hyoid is here. Then the infrahyoid muscles. So these are the infrahyoid muscles. These are the infrahyoid muscles. So this is how you name the infrahyoid muscles. Uh, there is a muscle called sternohyoid attached between the, uh, the this one, long one, uh, that attached between the sternum and the hyoid. So this is sternohyoid. Then you have omohyoid. Omohyoid is attached between the scapula here. You get the scapula here. Between the scapula, and the, uh, the hyoid bone with the sling here. So you have superior belly of omohyoid and inferior belly of omohyoid. So you get the sternohyoid muscle and you get omohyoid muscle. If you cut them off and remove them, you will see the deep layer of muscles which is shown on this side, which is shown on this side. So once this, these two muscles are removed, you see uh, thyrohyoid, very short muscle, thyrohyoid muscle and sternothyroid muscle. So sternothyroid, thyrohyoid, sternohyoid, you know, the long muscle and omohyoid. So these are the, uh, the four muscles. It's easy to remember. Okay. Uh, and these muscles are, are the depressors of the, when they contract, they will depress the hyoid bone with the larynx. So they are depressors of the larynx. Uh, the, the action is opposite to the action of suprahyoid muscles. And these are the muscles that are supplied by ansa cervicalis. I told you about the ansa cervicalis um, formed by the branches of the cervical plexus. So this ansa cervicalis, which is like this, will supply these uh, infrahyoid uh, muscles. They are called infrahyoid strap muscles. Okay, strap muscles. Um, Okay. Uh, anything you want to say? I heard someone's mic. Oh, it's okay to hear the mic, but let me check. Mute all. Okay. Then. Uh, Why did I put this infrahyoid muscles? Okay, this is to show you this ansa cervicalis. So you see the ansa cervicalis here, superior uh, root, uh, inferior root and superior root of ansa cervicalis, supplying all these uh, infrahyoid uh, strap muscles. Uh, so that is the point that I wanted to raise there, I think. Um, and you can also see this, you know, stylo. Uh, Glossus, this one styloglossus is the tongue muscle, and you can see the stylohyoid muscle. This is stylohyoid. Okay, so these are suprahyoid muscles, stylohyoid uh, muscle there. 
then uh, we will take uh, triangles and discuss them carotid triangle now you know suprahyoid and infrahyoid muscles uh, and you know uh, the actual muscles and their nerve supply some idea about the nerve supply uh, we will go uh, to the triangles one by one and see the contents of the uh, triangles now the carotid triangle uh, is defined like uh, uh, you have uh, say i don't know why i put carotid triangle here now the carotid triangle uh, i'll show you here carotid triangle is this one okay carotid triangle is this one you get uh, the posterior belly of digastric in front you get the sternocleidomastoid behind and the superior belly of omohyoid uh, again you know in front so that is carotid uh, triangle uh, so the carotid triangle uh, uh, an important landmark an important landmark for carotid triangle is the tip of the greater horn of hyoid actually you can uh, you can try to palpate uh, the you can palpate if you palpate your neck don't palpate both sides if you palpate your neck here uh, you can feel the uh, the greater horn of the uh, hyoid bone here okay uh, so that is a, an important landmark for your carotid triangle because if you can palpate it then you are inside the carotid uh, triangle okay uh, you are inside the carotid triangle if you uh, get at the uh, tip of the greater horn of hyoid uh, and you can see in the carotid triangle you can see the hypoglossal nerve here these are the structures in the carotid triangle it enters the carotid triangle here then it leaves the carotid triangle and enters the now what you get here is the digastric triangle or the submandibular triangle the other triangle above it we'll come back to it so the hypoglossal nerve comes um, goes through the carotid triangle and enters the digastric triangle so this is the nerve that uh, supplies the muscles of the tongue okay main nerve of the muscles of the tongue uh, so it goes like that then other than that you get the bifurcation of the common carotid uh, artery there to its uh, the external and internal carotid uh, arteries uh, then uh, you also see uh, the branches of the external carotid artery now this is called superior thyroid artery uh, so it lies in the carotid triangle then you get uh, this superior laryngeal branch of the uh, the vagus nerve so you can't see the superior laryngeal one it has two branches internal and external laryngeal nerves uh, so these are given off i'll show you them with other diagram so this is the superior thyroid artery and this is the superior laryngeal nerve coming from the vagus nerve dividing into internal laryngeal and external laryngeal branches uh, so your carotid triangle is somewhere here um, then uh, okay okay the same thing the text is the same okay so i am just changing the diagram so remember uh, some of these contents of the uh, carotid triangle actually this is an area where you can feel for carotid pulse so in the carotid triangle if you press carotid triangle you can feel for carotid pulse uh, you are not uh, you are advised not to palpate for both both carotid pulse at the same time like this uh, on yourself or you know on another person because that can stimulate this baroreceptors in that area when you when you apply pressure they are sensitive to pressure and you can get uh, bradycardia and all, all that okay uh, then the digastric triangle or the submandibular triangle uh, which is this triangle uh, so it's bounded uh, superiorly by the, uh, the the inferior border of the mandible then uh, inferiorly by the anterior and posterior bellies of the digastric muscle uh, anteriorly and posteriorly uh, so in that triangle you get this important gland submandibular gland with some of the submandibular lymph nodes in that area so remember that point then as i said before the hypoglossal nerve comes uh, through the carotid triangle and goes up uh, into the uh, submandibular triangle uh, before it enters the uh, gives the supply to the tongue muscle then you get the facial vessels facial artery and uh, vein in that uh, area 
so you can see the maybe you can see the ducts of the submandibular gland also um, with its uh, lymph nodes, submandibular lymph nodes. So these are some of the, uh, the structures in the uh, the digastric or the submandibular triangle. Then the submental triangle, uh, it's a very uh, simple uh, triangle. So you get the midline here, you get the anterior belly of digastric here and the hyoid bone, body of the hyoid bone, forming uh, one side of a triangle. Then you have another triangle on the other side. You get the submental lymph nodes, submental lymph nodes. These lymph nodes drain the tip of the tongue, submental lymph nodes. Then you get the anterior jugular veins, uh, some branch, uh, tributaries of the anterior jugular veins. So this is mylohyoid muscle uh, and these are digastric muscles. Okay. Then the, the, the muscular triangle, muscular triangle is formed uh, behind, uh, the, the, you get the midline here, then you get the superior belly of omohyoid here and the sternocleidomastoid. Of course, you get the hyoid bone, little bit of hyoid bone there. And that forms the muscular uh, triangles. Now, the muscular triangles, which uh, are in this area, muscular triangle area, something like this, uh, the, that will actually contain the thyroid glands, the parathyroid glands, then parts of the trachea, larynx, uh, and uh, esophagus uh, will be there uh, with their vessels and nerves and you will get some of the lymph nodes in that area. So just, you can just work it out. Okay, so if you know the, tri the definition of the, the boundaries of the triangles, you don't have to buy hard this, you know, I'm just, uh, just you know, mentioning it so that you will you know, get an idea about what it is. Then uh, I'll, I'll remove the video, sorry. Now, uh, external jugular vein. Now, this is how you uh, surface mark the external jugular vein in the neck. You get the angle of the mandible on your body. You get the, sorry. You get the angle of the mandible here. You get the midpoint of the clavicle. Then you draw an imaginary line. So that marks your external jugular vein. Now, if you draw another line on the sternocleidomastoid from the mastoid process to the uh, the sternoclavicular joint here roughly then you can see that these will cross each other like an X okay so external jugular vein uh, crosses the sternocleidomastoid uh, from anterior to posterior now the other important point this is important later in the next slide now if you if you uh, draw the the internal jugular vein now this is external jugular vein internal jugular vein is you start drawing it uh, between the mastoid process and the mandible somewhere here and then you draw it along the uh, along the sternocleidomastoid covered by the sternocleidomastoid like that so you know if you draw the internal jugular vein like this internal jugular vein again that also actually just like the sternocleidomastoid crosses the external jugular vein like an x okay so it's uh, it's actually going like this to the two heads of under the two heads of the sternum, cleidomastoid, uh, something like this. Okay, um, so roughly it also crosses the sternum, uh, the, the external jugular vein. Now the the surface marking is like this. Now sometimes uh, there are central venous uh, cannula that are uh, inserted into the external jugular vein. Now uh, sometimes you cannot access peripheral veins; maybe they are collapsed. Or sometimes you know you have to keep uh, a venous uh, cannula for a long period of time uh, those who are in the intensive care units you have to give them uh, what are called parenteral parenteral nutrition iv nutrition fluids uh, infused fluids and nutrition or drugs for a long time um, then you put this uh, the central venous uh, cannula into the external jugular vein now, if you know the surface marking, then you can actually uh, put the uh, cannula into the external jugular vein. You should get trained to do it. You can't just put it. Okay. Uh, then the internal jugular vein, uh, more than the external jugular vein, internal jugular vein has a constant position. Uh, it's from the midpoint, as I said, the midpoint between the tip of the mastoid process and the, uh, the angle of the 
mandible uh, to the sternoclavicular joint. Uh, and as I said before, it's overlapped by the sternocleid mastoid. Uh, and in the lower part, it lies between the two heads of the uh, sternocleid mastoid. Two heads of the sternum. This is one head, this is the other head, sternal and clavicular head. So this is the internal jugular vein. So actually you can you can put a, put a catheter, you can catheterize these uh, internal jugular veins either to monitor blood pressure or if you want to put a catheter into the heart for certain procedures, maybe, you know, I don't know the details of that. You can put a catheter through the internal jugular vein uh, and you can enter through the two heads of sternocleidal mastoid muscle. And usually the right side is approached because the right internal jugular vein, I don't know whether I have mentioned it uh, somewhere. Uh, maybe here. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's somewhere it's mentioned. You usually use the right um, uh, right uh, internal jugular vein because that is uh, more in line with the superior vena cava. So you can easily put rather than going through the left internal jugular vein. Uh, so so that's another point that you need to uh, remember. Uh, then uh, you can either go behind or you can either go in front of the sternocleidomastoid and enter here, or you can go behind it and enter it. Okay, so these procedures you don't have no details of it. Okay, in front or uh, behind, okay. uh, and enter the internal jugular vein while it is in the carotid sheath here. Okay, so you have to pierce the um, uh, investing layer of deep cervical fascia and the carotid sheath both to uh, enter the internal jugular vein uh, for uh, catheterization. So here. Uh, in the theater, you can see the theater uh, theater clothes here. This uh, they, they have drawn the, the sternocleidomastoid. They have drawn uh, the the internal. Um, this is the external jugular vein they have drawn. So then uh, they are going to put it here into the internal jugular vein. Oh, you know they might go from behind somewhere. I don't know the details of this. Uh, then about the arteries. A uh, few things about the arteries. Common carotid arteries extends from the sternoclavicular joint. Again, from the same joint, sternoclavicular joint, somewhere here. Uh, the, the arteries extend from the sternoclavicular joint uh, to the upper border of the thyroid cartilage. You know, your thyroid cartilage is somewhere here. So that is common carotid in that area. Then at that point, it bifurcates into internal and external carotid uh, arteries. Uh, so you learn the relations, you know. Uh, Go through it and learn the relations. Of course, the internal jugular vein lies laterally in the carotid sheath. And behind, you get the vagus nerve. You remember? Uh, behind and laterally, you get the vagus nerves and you know, other structures. Uh, so this is uh, roughly, this is therefore the superior border of the thyroid uh, cartilage where the common carotid divides into internal and external carotid. Uh, now, if you draw the carotid sheath, if you draw the carotid sheath, uh, around this, uh, this is how you draw it. Carotid sheath is drawn like this. So you, it either includes the internal carotid if it is above the, the level of the superior border of thyroid, or if it is below the level of the superior thyroid, it includes the common carotid uh, artery. Then uh, you can see another point. Uh, once it divides into internal carotid and external carotid, um, internal carotid has got no branches. Internal has no branches in the neck. Uh, external carotid has got several branches. You can see uh, actually if you count there are eight branches. Okay. So with this diagram always remember this cross section of the carotid sheath. Okay. So where you get the common carotid vessel or internal carotid vessel inside that with the internal jugular vein lying lateral to it and the vagus nerve lying uh, behind to it. Uh, so these are the branches of the external carotid artery. There are eight branches. Uh, I, I think you know you can go through the branches. Okay, so there are uh, three branches to the front. Uh, you get the superior thyroid, lingual, and facial arteries. Then uh, to the back you get the occipital artery and the posterior auricular artery, which is not shown here. Posterior auricular and ascending pharyngeal arteries. Uh, that makes it six. Then uh, the final two arteries where the, uh, the external carotid ends by 
giving two final branches, the superficial temporal artery and the maxillary artery uh, that is behind the ramus of the mandible. Uh, so these are the eight branches. You can uh, study these branches. Then the internal carotid artery, as I said before, it has no branches in the neck. It extends from the upper border of the thyroid cartilage because that's where the common carotid bifurcates and uh, it extends to the carotid canal. And within the carotid canal, uh, through the carotid canal of the petrous uh, temporal bone, it passes and then it passes through the cavernous sinus. Uh, and then, uh, you know, when it is inside the, 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 the petrous temporal bone, it starts giving branches. Then um, it has several branches. Uh, it is actually divided into seven segments. You don't have to know all that. Seven segments. So each of these segments will give branches. Uh, but uh, uh, once it comes out uh, from the cavernous sinus, uh, it gives uh, certain branches that you all know about. Uh, the ophthalmic branch, posterior communicating, anterior cerebral, and middle cerebral branches. So all these branches you will learn when you do the blood supply of the brain. Okay. Uh, so these are blood vessels that supply the brain and the ophthalmic one is the one that supplies the eye. So don't think that the internal carotid only gives these branches. Before these are given, there are many branches given while it is inside the petrous temporal bone. Then the, uh, when it comes to the root of the neck, that is this area, root of the neck, uh, we have discussed about the triangles. Now whatever that passes between the, uh, the, the neck and the upper limb here, or the neck and the thorax, or the thorax and the upper limb. So this direct, this either direction, either direction here, or either direction here. Uh, so all these structures that pass like this will have to pass through the root of the neck. So when there are tumors uh, or some swellings due to trauma in that area, can obstruct any of these vessels, uh, which is actually called uh, the thoracic uh, outlet syndrome. Okay, so I think we have discussed it sometime then. Uh, yeah, uh, the subclavian uh, arteries uh, at the root of the neck, uh, subclavian arteries, right subclavian artery arises from the brachiocephalic uh, artery. Uh, so that is behind the sternoclavicular joint. So that's almost outside the superior mediastinum, but the left one since it arises from the, uh, the arch of the aorta, aortic arch, uh, it actually starts in the superior mediastinum at a lower level, left subclavian. Then both um, passes upwards and laterally uh, uh, over the, uh, the, the pleura and then uh, at the outer border of the first rib, if you get the first rib like this, the two first ribs like that, at the outer border of the first rib, it becomes the axillary artery, subclavian here, axillary here. And the subclavian artery, which is not a very long course, subclavian artery here uh, can be divided into, uh, now you know the axillary artery was divided into one to three parts. Subclavian also can be divided into three parts by the presence of the, uh, now this is the subclavian artery, by the presence of the scalenous uh, anterior uh, muscle. Now the scalenous anterior muscle is like this, attached to the scalenic tubercle. So this is called first part, the part behind the muscle is called second part and the pass lateral to the um, muscle is called third part. Now, when you divide the subclavian artery into parts like that, uh, first part is the most important part. Uh, it has three main branches, vertebral artery, which passes through the foramina transverse area, you know that, vertebral artery, and the internal thoracic artery or internal memory artery, you know that, when you have done the thorax, you have studied it, internal thoracic, uh, going uh, behind the, the costal cartilages here at the lateral border of the sternum and the manubrium uh, and it gives anterior intercostal arteries uh, and divides uh, at the end. Then you get the thyrocervical trunk. Thyrocervical trunk uh, itself has three important branches. One is inferior thyroid. One is inferior thyroid, other one is supra, suprascapular, inferior thyroid, suprascapular and transverse cervical. 
inferior thyroid, suprascapular, and transverse cervical artery. Now, this transverse cervical artery, the branches of the transverse cervical artery and the, uh, the, the suprascapular artery uh, are the ones that are involved in uh, scapular anastomosis when you did the upper limb, uh, you studied that. Then the second part, the part behind the, the, the scalenus anterior uh, can give a branch which is called costocervical trunk, uh, which itself has a you know, few branches. Then the third part, usually it has not got branches, the third part, but sometimes it can have a, a dorsal scapular artery. Uh, and when you, know, when you have a branch from the third part, actually there are changes to these branches here, which is a little bit complicated. Okay. So, you know, you get some of these branches changing when you have a dorsal scapular artery. So, when you read textbooks, you see this difference. Some books uh, mention dorsal scapula here. Some books put it here as a branch of the thyrocervical trunk. If you want, you can read it. I will not mention it here. Uh, okay, then, you know, another clinical point, uh, even though you don't have to know about these procedures just have an idea because uh, this is the reason why you learn this stuff uh, subclavian vein now initially we said uh, we can put uh, uh, cannula into the external jugular vein we can put catheters into the internal jugular vein there are different approaches then similarly you can put a catheter into the um, subclavian vein uh, now uh, you can you can do it inferior to the clavicle or superior to the clavicle that way or this way now here one procedure is shown putting a needle into the, uh, the subclavian vein below the clavicle so what they have done is here below the lower border of the clavicle at the junction between you get the junction between the lateral two-thirds and the medial one-third of the clavicle and then uh, you direct the needle, you put the needle, insert the needle directed towards the suprasternal notch here. Directed towards suprasternal notch. So you are entering the subclavian uh, vein there. Then in superior approach, what you do is uh, you go uh, lateral to the, you get the uh, clavicular head of the sternocleidomastoid and go immediately lateral to it. The nipple directed, uh, the, the, the needle directed towards the opposite nipple here. The needle directed towards the opposite nipple, you enter uh, into the subclavian vein. Then few things about the thoracic duct in the neck. Uh, we, are, we are talking about the root of the neck here. Thoracic duct, uh, thoracic duct opens to the left side. Uh, so it drains blood from all over the body except for the right side of the head and neck region, right side of the thorax and right upper limb. Uh, it drains all other areas, including lower limbs, uh, both lower limbs, abdomen, uh, left side of the thorax, head and neck, left upper limb, and all that. Ultimately, it drains into the junction between the left subclavian, you can read it, and the internal left internal jugular vein to the junction. Uh, and so on the right side, uh, since the thoracic duct is not draining the right upper limb and head and neck and the thorax, right side, uh, there is another. Uh, lymphatic duct called right lymphatic trunk, right lymphatic duct that actually opens into the same area on the right side, junction between the uh, right subclavian and the, the, the internal right internal jugular vein. So there is a junction like that, internal jugular and right subclavian. Uh, and sometimes it does not open to the right side, uh, but then uh, the right lymphatic duct also opens into the thoracic duct, and then through the thoracic duct it opens into the left side. So can be either way. So, uh, so this uh, is this brings us to the end of the lecture. Uh, now, the the thyroid and parathyroid uh, glands, submandibular glands, cervical lymph nodes. I think you better study these uh, things and uh, come back for the uh, other lectures. Okay, I'll, I'll stop the recording here.